So without further ado, I would like to introduce Kakani Katija, who will present a high level overview of FathomNet, as well as an introduction to the ecosystem resources and generalized use cases. Kakani is a pr principal engineer and principal investigator at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute and leads the Bio Inspiration Lab. Her research is dedicated to developing underwater technologies to better observe biological and physical processes where they happen in the ocean, and she's been fearlessly leading the FathomNet effort since its inception in 2018. So I'll turn it over to you, Kakani. Thanks, Katie, and thanks for the fabulous introduction. Um, there is quite a history with this project, so um, you know I think it's important for everybody to to at least understand the the beginnings. You know, I also want to add that you know, as as Katie had also mentioned, uh, you know, this this problem of processing underwater visual data is is a, is a, an effort that's been ongoing to I mean lots of different institutions but especially in Ambari since its inception so it's it's been wonderful to um, be able to to work on this problem and also think beyond just Ambari's walls and try to come up with solutions that can help uh, address the needs of a much broader community and so with that I wanted to um, kind of go over maybe the the long-term goal. And I, I always like to be inspired by the work that's being done in other areas or in other fields um, that you know, we might someday be able to obtain or, or reach. And um, one really great example uh, of this is the Argo uh, float program. And so the different colors here on this map indicates uh, different floats that have been deployed in the ocean. Uh, you can see basically amazing coverage uh, in, in most of the ocean basins. And uh, this program in particular has, you know, really changed or transformed the way that the chemical and physical sensing um, environment uh, communities have, have been able to, you know, uh, be able to observe the ocean system. And what they've also managed to achieve is this really incredible data sharing program. The idea that, you know, when a float comes to the surface, it offloads its information and then that gets shared, you know, um, over the internet widely uh, for anyone to use within a matter of hours. And so how do we get from, you know, this, how do we get to this kind of situation where we have amazing coverage of the ocean, in particular, if we're we're talking about like biological observations or visual observations, and so I'd like to um, pull up kind of the the current state of of our situation for observing uh, marine life, particularly over a long period of time. And I just want to highlight this paper by Aaron Satterthwaite and a whole bunch of other uh, authors, where they you know pulled all this data that exists either in OBIS and GBIF, you know, a big data aggregation um, databases. And what they were looking for, right, was different data that um, highlights uh, biological observations, at least long duration biological observations. Uh, they, their focus is primarily on the surface. Uh, and what they found was, you know, indicated by either the blue or green colors here, uh, was that on average, um, there's about 7% of surface coverage or surface area that we have uh, coverage for long-term biological observations. So again, keep in mind that that is the surface area of, of this entire vast ocean. Never mind, right, the fact that I like to remind everybody that, you know, the ocean is this massive volume. Uh, and so for those of us who recognize this, this is a Statue of Liberty on the left and uh, on the right is one of Ambari's research vessels, the Rachel Carson. And, you know, the, the upper ocean, right, the lighted surface of uh, the uh, ocean waters is, you know, uh, represented largely by two stacked uh, uh, Statues of Liberty. But then if we're talking about the entire ocean, this is just a diagrammatic representation of the average depth of the ocean, so about 4,000 meters. And so this entire region, right, of the ocean, like we have to think beyond just surface observations and start focusing a little bit more on trying to get coverage, right, of the entire volume of the ocean. So that's roughly 97% of the habitable ecosystem or habitable um, volume on this planet. 
Uh, and depending on who you are, or what kinds of numbers you 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 see, for instance, NOAA has an estimate that you know about twenty less than twenty percent of this volume has been explored. I expect when we're talking about visual systems or collecting image data, uh, that number is going to be much much less than that. Um, on top of that, right, we've got these other challenges where anywhere from thirty to sixty percent of life in the ocean is undescribed. Uh, and there's anywhere, it, it takes on average about 21 years uh, from the time you first observe a, a, spe a new species to one, one, when it becomes actually described. And so we've, we've got massive gaps in our ability to observe the ocean, never mind our ability to also um, observe and, and describe life that's there. And so I also want to couple that, right? So we've got this paucity, this lack of information, but we're also starting to see this massive explosion in the ways that we can observe, you know, life or uh, features underwater. And, you know, I like to use at least in Bari's experience as like a, a nice little metaphor, let's say for, for the rest of the community in that, you know, we might have started with one or two vehicles to do kind of these kinds of observations or explorations. Like in this case, we started with Ventana, you know, now we're operating three remotely operated vehicles, uh, but now you move from remotely operated vehicles to autonomous systems, uh, some of which have more than one camera or one visual feed that you're collecting information with. Uh, I like to highlight the, um, the Benthic rover there on the bottom. Lots of people have heard about the Mars rovers, less so that there are rovers uh, in the ocean that are collecting lots of visual data. Um, and then now we have autonomous systems, camera landers, et cetera, that just have anywhere from two to six uh, or seven uh, imaging uh, systems. And so we're collecting so much data without a real mechanism or plan for how we process that, right? How do we scale our capabilities to process this information and make it available and useful? And as you know, visual data uh, has a lot of value and a lot of information. So this is an example of a benthic dive using a remotely operated vehicle. And as it's very clear from this footage, you've got lots of different animals, different species, you also have different numbers of them, maybe um, uh, you know association with different types of topography, and so the challenge is to go from this visual data, right? It's uh, pixel-based information, and convert it to something that you know researchers or ecologists can then use, uh, and then inform you know management or you know how do you how do you continue conserving or or uh, responsibly using these spaces, and so. How do we get from visual data like this to actionable data that researchers can then use? And so, right, given the paucity, so given the need of the kinds of uh, observations that uh, we require, plus this explosion of visual data, what we're seeing, right, is just a deluge of information that's that's you know hitting us right now, and we have to really think about you know addressing this this challenge or need. And I also want to say that. You know, it, it's one thing to have these crude systems, these more expensive systems, uh, but then, you know, longer term, what we're going to be wanting is, is robotic vehicles that are able to, you know, smartly identify or, um, you know, observe phenomena where we need them to. And so we also have to think about, you know, algorithmic developments that will allow us to expand our capabilities beyond just these crude and more expensive systems. And so this is actually part of the reason why I've started thinking a lot about, you know, something like Fathomit. You know, I wanted to um, create algorithms that could be ported onto vehicles that could go out and search for novel life, observe it, track it, say something about their behavior uh, and ecology. And so one of the challenges that we faced was that, you know, using uh, plain Jane uh, computer vision algorithms just wasn't enough, because as you'll see in this example, even working in the ocean's midwaters, you often come across lots of different animals that can often confuse, you know, the algorithms that you're running. And so in this case, the red circles indicate um, objects that we're trying to track as part of our field tests. And then the blue dot indicates the particular target that we're currently autonomously tracking. And a squid literally in this run ran into the salp that we were originally tracking. And you'll notice that blue dot has transferred over onto the squid. We've changed the, the vehicle behavior. And then shortly after this interaction, you have that squid, right? 
being joined by lots of other animals. Um, unfortunately, we were able to continue tracking on the original target, but really we need smarter algorithms to avoid these challenges, be able to distinguish between these uh, different animals. And the needs for developing those kinds of algorithms is similar, right, to the needs of the community when it comes to uh, automating or at least accelerating our capacity for processing visual data. Uh, and so we've all seen videos like this, right? These tantalizing um, demonstrations of how algorithms like these can, can be used um, in, in, in visual data, right? And so it, what we've often wondered, well, if we have this capacity, if we have this capability to, to process information in terrestrial space, surely we could do that underwater. And so that was really kind of the jumping off point for a lot of us, not just the FathomNet group, but I would say, argue the whole community is whether or not artificial intelligence can be used to address some of these data challenges that we face. Um, and so I first want to kind of give a very, very high level definition of things. So we, we all can agree on some terms. You know, first, artificial intelligence is this massive umbrella term that describe, you know, really just programs that have the ability to learn and reason like humans, right? Very, very high level, um, broad, broad reaching definition. And then a subset of algorithms within artificial intelligence is known as machine learning. And so these are algorithms that have the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. And a subset of that is deep learning. So these are multi-layered neural networks that can adapt and learn from vast amounts of data. And it's actually deep learning algorithms at least seem to look like they have the best potential when it comes to processing visual data. Um, and there's been plenty of examples of this, not only in the terrestrial space or the computer vision space, but also within the ocean science space. And so in order to train, though, these deep learning algorithms, what's really required, right, is, is data and lots of it, but very particular types of data. Uh, so first, you know, I want to at least high level explain what the differences in data are and how they can be used for this particular application. Uh, so first, you know, you can subdivide data into either unlabeled or labeled data. And so when I say unlabeled data, that means data that really nobody has taken a look at. You don't really know what's in that, that uh, you know, that data box or uh, packet. But then the other data is what we call label data. And so labeled data is data that somebody has reviewed, somebody has looked at. And so we know precisely what is in that information. And it's labeled data that is then used to train these deep learning algorithms. Uh, but labeled data means different things to different people. Uh, and I just want to at least uh, set this definition straight um, so that we're using consistent definitions. And so if we were to do a search for um, a jellyfish uh, image within, like, let's start with the Ambari's VARS database. Uh, and this is an example of one of the images that it would, be, would return. Um, and it's pretty obvious in this image what the jelly is, right? It's the only object in this image. It's also centered, uh, zoomed right in. So it's pretty clear that there's just this one thing that we're trying to learn that, that um, represents this concept. But if you also look at the other images or other data that are in the database, this is an example of what one of those images would look like. So if you don't actually know what a jellyfish looks like, um, you know, it's hard to tell what are, of all of these objects that are in this frame, which ones correspond to the right concept. And so when we talk about labeled data, we talk about not only adding the name of a particular concept, but also identifying where in the image that animal or that concept is. And in this case, we're using a bounding box to indicate where these localizations live. And then on top of that, not only do you need to add this information or, or create these labels for the, the concept that you're interested in, we also need to create labels for other concepts that might be within an image. And so in this case, this is an example of something that's been labeled that can then be used for the subsequent stages of training an algorithm. 
So you take your labeled data, you train an algorithm, and then you take a subset of that labeled data and you use it for testing and then later evaluation. And so the idea then is you can evaluate how well your algorithm is working. If, if you're not happy with the performance of that algorithm, you can then either add more labeled data or make changes to the architecture that you're using, for example. But once you kind of iterate on that and you have a, an algorithm or model that you're really happy with, that you think the performance is, is, is meeting your requirements, you can then apply that algorithm on your unlabeled data and then generate inference or predictions for what is in it. And so it's at this stage, right, that one could then review the predictions and, and correct and, and, and then continue using this information. And so the challenge that everyone faces with uh, these deep learning algorithms really is the generation of, of labeled data. It's the mat, it's the big bottleneck, the big elephant in the room that nobody likes to talk about. Uh, but that's that's actually what we're trying to tackle here. Um, and so we really took inspiration though from how the computer vision communities have been operating in this space. And there are two um, big data sets, uh, one called ImageNet and one called COCO that has essentially transformed the computer vision communities and has really pushed forward these uh, algorithmic improvements that we, we now use and rely on. So first, uh, the first one I like to highlight, you know, ImageNet has 15,000, over 15,000 paper citations. Um, I would never be able to publish a paper like that. But both of these databases house incredible quantities of, of data. Um, ImageNet has 14 million images that represent 22,000 different object categories. Microsoft Cocoa has 330,000 images, but one and a half million object instances and 80 object categories. But the idea is that by aggregating this information and making that available much more broadly, you know, to the computer vision community, but also in our case, the marine science community, we may be able to create this kind of central uh, repository, but also central hub for people to go to and also um, use and test algorithms on. And so that was the idea behind why we wanted to establish FathomNet. The idea that you know each one of us, you know, depending on our research labs, our research institutions, where we conduct work, we are all generating so much uh, information and visual data, but we haven't really created an outlet for all of us to aggregate that information, put it together, and then actually create this kind of central resource for the community. Um, and so, what we wanted to do with FathomNet is just that. Uh, this is an idea, as Katie uh, mentioned, you know, founding institutions uh, in Bari, Sea Vision, and Ocean Discovery League. And we've got uh, data contributions from a number of different groups, um, including uh, University of Plymouth, who also submitted data more recently. And the goal here, um, if we can at least put bounds right on, on our goals for FathomNet, is that we would love to create anywhere from 500 to 1,000 images per concept of animalia described in worms. So that's uh, over 200,000 animals. And so that means this would become a massive database for information. And that's okay, we can scale it. But in order for that to happen, we really need community engagement. And um, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. And so what we've been able to do, you know, we launched uh, FathomNet at, at our website, uh, www.fathomnet.org and in September of 2021. So that was a beta launch. And what that means is really, it's just open to the community and we want your feedback and let us know how we can improve uh, with a goal of uh, getting to uh, uh, version 1.0 uh, middle of this year. And I'll talk about the, the process for what that will look like. But I also want to be very clear that, oh, and we, we did uh, publish a paper in scientific reports that describe the database. So if you want more information, you can um, definitely check that out. And I want to make sure that you understand that, you know, in our mind, FathomNet really isn't just a database, but it's an ecosystem of resources that can address a number of needs for the community. Uh, you know, first and foremost, right, the website can be accessed via an application programming interface or um, API. Uh, on the website, you can very easily explore the data that are currently uh, submitted to FathomNet. Uh, you can see, you know, geographic uh, results for where these uh, labels might be coming from. 
Uh, you can also look at other metadata. So, you know, depth, time, location, who has made the contribution. All of that information is tracked within the FathomNet database. Uh, we also created a very, very lightweight annotation tool. Um, this is because, you know, a lot of us collect uh, visual data for a particular purpose or a particular reason. Like, for instance, I'm really into snot palaces right now, and so I'm probably labeling only data of, of larvations, but there could be a jellyfish, or in this case, a tinophore, also in an image, and I don't know what those animals are myself. So being able to create a tool that allows people to augment data currently in the database was really important to us. Um, and then we also have lots of tutorials, uh, either on our, our blog at medium.com, YouTube, or on GitHub. Uh, we'll talk about those resources uh, next. Uh, and then uh, we've created a collection of machine learning models that can be found in our model zoo, also on GitHub. Uh, and Eric will be talking about that um, just a bit later. And so really, I think what's important here is that we're trying to leverage widely available open source tools for these kinds of architectures that can then be used by the community. We really just wanna open up our capacity beyond you know, the, the, the research, let's say, um, uh, hubs and, and, and include more individuals and become more accessible. Um, and so I wanna say that Fathomet has many potential uses uh, and then four key communities that uh, Fathomet can benefit. Uh, the first are obviously taxonomists um, because it's, it's a way that we could provide collaborative a global marine life key that has flexible hierarchies that can also aggregate observations of known and unknown biota. So by creating this, this hub for uh, collaboration, we might be able to help further and, and push forward um, uh, uh, discoveries of, of life that we might not have been able to do before. Obviously, I think we're also targeting programmers, the idea that we can deliver access to a novel data set that can be used to develop and evaluate uh, state-of-the-art uh, computer vision algorithms. Um, this is really, really important because that, you know, that entire field is, is, is transforming constantly. And we would love it uh, to have that kind of level of interest in underwater um, app, uh, vision applications as well. And then also enthusiasts. I think you know, we've, we've spoken with a lot of enthusiasts. In fact, we have um, members of the live stream oceanographic community that have helped us understand that they would like to contribute more. You know, this is the ocean is an important place with lots of interesting um, and I don't know exciting uh, life. And you know, there's ways that we can incorporate uh, their energy and their expertise into this process as well. Uh, and then finally, educators. You know, the fact that we can provide resources and access to ocean visual data for experiential learning opportunities. And so for the purposes of this, uh, this workshop, we're really focusing on the, the first three. Um, taxonomists also includes marine scientists. Uh, but the idea is that, you know, we'd love to hear from you also what you think uh, FathomNet can, can be useful for you. And so back to that question, can artificial intelligence address our data challenges? Uh, we think with labeled databases like FathomNet, the answer is yes. And I just wanted to share with you a couple highlights. Um, for instance, you know, we've uh, Lonnie, uh, who's on here, has has trained um, a Yolo V5 model using data in FathomNet, and then we've run this on um, the, the same visual data that I showed earlier, and you can already see that we're getting pretty great IDs on um, individuals. Um, obviously, we're missing some things. It's not 100% accurate, but this is the process of eventually getting there. Uh, we have to start somewhere. And I should also add that these models are, can be available to download in the FabNet Model Zoo right now. Um, other applications, right, is that tracking one that I, I mentioned earlier. This is what keeps me up at night is the idea that I, if I want to track a, a jellyfish for 24 hours with an autonomous system, again, not losing that animal so that we can do these long duration observations. And in this case, you could see that, you know, our tracking is not disrupted, even if there's other animals or other objects that come into the field. And then I think what's really exciting is the fact that, you know, we are able to um, get to this point where we can pre-program a vehicle to go out and find particular animals that we want to study. In this case, like a, a giant larvation, and it's not palace. Uh, in the top left, this you can see the mode of the vehicle. So we're in search now, and then as we get closer to you know an object of interest, um, it starts to compare the detections with the the search class, 
You can see we transition to acquire and then finally track once we verify that those IDs are, are the right thing. So the idea is that you know with these, this, these label data that it exists in Fathomnet, we can really usher in a whole bunch of new algorithmic developments that can help solve a number of different problems that we're, we're facing in the ocean science community. Uh, so with that, I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Or not. Going once, going twice. You can always put questions in the chat. Great, we've got a question Janet. from Janet. Oh, we do have a few questions. So we have about eight minutes for questions right now. Perfect. So I'll Janet. Myself. <laughs> um, so I went on FathomNet and I noticed there's a lot of like still imagery. Um, is Are there any videos gonna be put up there? Or? That's a really good question. Um, we are starting with image data first for uh, training or for at least the label data. Um, I know we've been also talking about doing hosting like data challenges and competitions um, where those competitions could involve video data. Uh, but right now we're starting with image data only as part of the FathomNet um, database. Thanks, Janet. We have a couple of questions related to the box and the annotation. One is whether or not the box annotation is sufficient. And another person asked how important that localization is. Right. Um, there's a number of us who can answer that question. But I mean, the first, it depends on your needs. I will say that, you know, Fathomet, the way we built Fathomet is we're starting with box, box annotations. Um, there are some groups, for instance, like the coral community that, that tends to also want to do segmentations or, you know, polygons for, um, for, you know, localizations. That's something that we've been discussing about being able to incorporate that into Fathomet eventually. Uh, but right now we're starting with boxes only. Um, I don't know if Eric, you want to add anything else to that. Um. No, not at not the moment, I don't think. Okay. Great. Um, Andrea asks, what other ways uh, are the identification data being used? Right. So, I mean, we have, so Karen Osborne, who's a, a researcher at the Smithsonian, she'll be uh, talking about um, some of the ways the marine science community might be able to use this data. I mean, what she's really interested in is finding out, you know, who who might be the people who are uploading uh, data of different animals she might be wanting to study. So as a mechanism to find new collaborators, um, also like new potential ranges or observations of animals that, you know, one might not expect to see in, in different locations or different environments. So so that's one way um, the, the, the data are, are potentially being used. Great, thanks. Um, we have a couple of questions related to um, skills required to do this. Um, George asks, so anyone can do this? And Megan asks, what level of programming skill do you need in general for the AI software? Yeah, um, like I said, everything is based on open source software. And there are so many um, resources now online describing how one can do that or use that. Um, we will also, as part of tomorrow's activities, walk you through using, you know, like the FathomNet Python API uh, in, a, in a collab notebook um, so that, you know, we basically lay out how you would use that data. Um, but I mean, Kevin, I don't know if you want to add anything else to that. Yeah, no, I, I'm just going to say that too. We do have that collab notebook. And actually today I'll be um, showing you the beginning portion of that. And tomorrow in the breakout session for the programmers group, we'll go into um, some examples of how you can actually pull down data sets and things like that. Um, I will say though, if you're not, if you don't have a programming background, uh, those notebooks are set up so that it's just point and click. So you can just click through the code and you can see the results and uh, progressively uh, experiment with different things as uh, fits your use case. Great. Thanks, Kevin. 
Um, I think that answers a few. There are some more detailed questions on like how exactly somebody would use this. So um, I think the short answer is we're going to get into that um, in more detail throughout today and um, tomorrow. And I do, there is another question about, um, from Paloma about how FathomNet could detect very specific high detailed features of organisms that might be necessary to identify to the species level. Absolutely. And that's, I think, one of the limitations, right, that all, all ecologists are finding with visual data. It's, it's um, you can't get down to species ID uh, for all of your imagery, right? Um, I know, uh, for instance, we were able to do that on Ambari partly because we've been doing all of this work in Monterey Bay, but especially if you're going to new places, oftentimes you need very zoomed in imagery or, you know, actual collections of the animal to look at let's say internal morphology that you just don't get with um, visual data alone. And so, you know, that is that is the current situation, but even genus level information, we just don't have, we just don't have looks or we just don't have an, a sufficient observations of, of life at this point. Um, and even genus level IDs is, is a fantastic um, advance forward for us. And that's the goal, right? To have you know thousands of images per species so that we can get to the the finest level of taxonomy possible but right like you say in some cases it's just not going to be possible because you can't count the gonads or you know whatever that identifying thing is in in the creature um a uh, great question from jorge uh how are the ids guaranteed Right. So this is a, an important piece of the process, which we will go over. I think Brian will probably talk about this within the website. Um, you know, unlike some databases, there is a level of verification that's required uh, where, you know, someone with the, the taxonomic expertise is able to go through and verify if the ID is, is accurate or close. I will talk about uh, tomorrow the some of the based on feedback we've already gotten from like our, our workshop last year, some of the the changes that we're making to FathomNet, at least the web user interface, so that we can uh, allow people to provide um, uh, like other guesses or suggestions, but also comment on those suggestions so that we can eventually land on the right ID. But again, this is all driven by the community, um, people who have this expertise and this knowledge. Great, thanks. Um, we're gonna need to take a break from questions right now. Um, I encourage the FathomNet team, there are a lot of great questions in the chat. Um, so if you have a moment to take a look at those and please reply, um, that would be great.